one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 110th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. You can call me JAG. I am the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways like our graphic novels and animated videos. I am so excited. I've been so looking forward to this today. We are joined by Dr. James Lindsay. Before I even get into introducing him, I want to remind all of you who are watching us, whether on Zoom or Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn, YouTube, use the comment section, type in your questions, make them short, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Dr. James Lindsay is a best-selling author, mathematician, and a cultural critic who has written six books on subjects including religion, uh, the philosophy of science, and postmodern theory. His newest book, Race Marxism, explores the origins of critical race theory as a reinvention of uh, Marxism focusing on race instead of class, and his most famous book so far, I guess I should add, is uh, one he co-authored with Helen Pluckrose. It's Cynical Theories, How Activist Scholarship Made Everything About Race, Gender, and Identity, and Why This Harms Everyone. Dr. Lindsay, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It'll be hard to top how Cynical Theories did. I'm happy to be able to report. I'm glad I got into so many hands. Um, yeah, absolutely. I highly recommend it. And uh, I would have to say also your co-author, uh, Helen Pluckrose, if uh, she needs to bring in some extra cash, she should start a hot side hustle as a, as a uh, narrator because she did a really wonderful job. She's a beautiful voice. That, um, we all tried to tell her that and she's so, she's British. So she has a little <laughs> bit of a roughneck London accent instead of like the posh ones. So she was so nervous about it. The British and their, their funny accent. Issues. No, no, it was it was amazing. I, you know, kind of had a hard time believing that that, that was was her, but it was it was beautifully done. Um, so, and of course, you and Helen and Peter Bogosian uh, teamed up to submit some twenty academic hoax papers, with seven of them getting published in prestigious peer-reviewed journals. Uh, the resulting uproar became known as the so-called square scandal, if I'm getting that right. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you came up with it, what happened, and uh, the reaction, of course, when it was discovered. Yeah, so I mean, this is a this is sort of like, in a sense, the origin story for how I ended up getting into this whole mess um, in, in, in 2017. Peter and Helen and I embarked on a mission to expose what we thought was a huge political corruption in academia, where they were publishing these absolutely absurd academic articles. And so we wrote, as you said, 20 of them over the course of a year, and which is a lot of academic articles. They usually it's one or two a year is a career. And wow. um, we did 20 in a single year, and we ended up getting seven of them accepted. Uh, seven of them we're still under peer review. The Wall Street Journal caught us. So six we had given up on and to, to account for everybody there. And what we were trying to do was expose that there's this, that you can actually write stuff that's either horrific or absolutely nonsense or just silly and terribly argued. Then they get these papers accepted as long as they had politically fashionable conclusions. In other words, that you could just introduce as, as a guy that Peter knows from Harvard, put it uh, opinion and prejudice and pass it off as knowledge by flattering the political views of the editors and peer reviewers of the journals. I think it's actually worse than that. I think it's that they don't know what constitutes legitimate research. Uh, so we submitted these peer reviewed articles. Um, some of them focused on how we might deal with say the issue of rape culture as a big feminist talking point by uh, considering the way that dogs have sex with one another in dog parks as a focus as a lens to focus on the issue through and then to train men that we, the way that we train dogs in order oh, to, you know, get them to not rape. And that, that won actually an award for excellence and scholarship. It's all just made up. In fact, it was the data didn't even make sense. It was, it was impossible data claiming that we saw thousands of dogs, tens of thousands of dogs uh, over the course of a small amount of a year. And so just 
absurd. We rewrote a chapter of Hitler's Mein Kampf as intersectional feminism, replacing his call for a, a movement, meaning the Nazi party, what became the Nazi party with intersectional feminism. And that was accepted by a feminist social work journal. We had a number of other pretty wild and crazy papers that get less and less PG as we go. Um, <laughs> the conceptual yeah, penis. I think. The conceptual penis was the very, very first foray into that. Yeah. Conceptual penis is a social construct um, where we argued that penises are not really best thought of as anatomical organs, but rather as a social construct that shapes how we interact with our world in a particularly nasty way. In fact, that it causes most of our problems, especially climate change. And so uh, by raping the natural environment, as we actually put it. So um, yeah, so the, 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 the purpose was to expose that these things could be, it was kind of like, what do they call a white hat uh, experiment? Can we get this stuff through peer review? Will they accept it? Will they publish it? What does this tell us about the state of peer review. And a lot of people wanted to conclude that peer review itself wasn't like they weren't being rigorous. And we tried to make clear, no, 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 they're, they're quite rigorous. They rejected a number of our papers for the right reasons. They were accepting papers that met their minimum standards of research, but it's that their standards of research are bad. And that's a much deeper and, and more significant problem. And so that was really the motivation behind that and what we exposed um, but in the process, what changed the course of my life is like, I didn't do this stunt and then decide, well, let's just keep going on the grift. Um, what happened was one of the papers was clearly, a, it was a, is an education paper and it was clearly advocating, openly advocating for abusing, especially white male students in order to get them to learn about and overcome their privilege. And, um, but we said we had to do it compassionately because we thought that was funny. And they replied the peer, or the, yeah, the peer reviewers replied, you can't use compassion because that threatens to recenter the needs of the privileged. You have to focus on their discomfort if you want to overcome wow. privilege. And I was like, holy crap, this is the seed of a genocide. And so everybody thought I was literally insane when I started calling this the seed of a genocide. But that level of ignoring the, uh, the, the humanity of a group of people for political ends is where genocides grow from. They don't necessarily sprout. They don't necessarily flourish in fruit but that's where that's the seed from which they grow. And so I remember asking my wife if I could quit my job and dedicate my life full time to reading and exposing what's going on in this academic and then historical liter philosophical literature. Um, and so that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Uh, how did that conversation go? <laughs> with my wife, she told me, she asked me kind of, you know, very practical, wonderful woman asked me, uh, can you make money doing it? And I said, I don't know. And she said, you have 18 months to find out. And so she was willing to take a risk on me. If it was this important to me, she was willing to take the chance. It took me 16 months till I could write my first salary check. So we got in right under the wire uh, <laughs> and the rest is kind of history. I mean, it also gave me a giant leg up into understanding what I'm dealing with, you know, and it's a, it's an interesting leg. It's worth mentioning because we studied, you know, a lot of people might go all the way back to Marx or they might go back before that and study Hegel or Rousseau. And, you know, Stephen Hicks has done an excellent job with decoding that philosophy from the beginning forward, but we started at the present day, how it's being used and worked our way backwards, mm -hmm. or I did at least all the way back to these same characters. And so it, it colors the perspective you have of Marx or the color that you have of Hegel or that you have of Rousseau to look way back into philosophical history. If you see that the end result of the, you know, what, what fruit are their ideas bearing now to understand what, came out of those ideas that led there, you don't, it's not just, oh, well, let's just look at the dialectic in an abstract sense. No, we started with, this is what the dialectic, dialectic has become. How did it get here and worked our way backwards through the literature? So it worked out to be a very interesting way to study this by starting at the wrong end and, and working our way back. Well, I think, uh, I think that's right. And of course, uh, Stephen Hicks is a senior scholar at the Atlas Society. He's been with us for a very long time. Uh, we've taken his explaining postmodernism and we've distilled it down into a pocket guide to postmodernism and our uh, postmodern postmodernism animated video in yeah. which we kind of give the parentage of it. But being fairly well versed with his uh, his work and the approach that he takes, that was really an interesting kind of background to uh, to reading cynical theories. And so let's get to that first. The title, you write that postmodernism's skepticism 
of science and other ways of dis discovering truth was quote, so profound as to be better understood as a type of cynicism about the entire history of human progress. So let's get to that. In what ways uh, does the cynicism define the entire postmodernism project to dismantle into enlightenment values? Well, I mean, like the, the, the with postmodernism specifically, the kind of underlying thesis is that every claim upon knowledge, every discourse, you know, so every kind of web of language that gets manifested around expressing knowledge or knowing anything or finding meaning in the world is ultimately just an expression of the power system that happens to be in place. And thus the people who benefit from the existing power system setting the terms of that system of knowledge or that system of, of discussion and discourse. So that's an extremely cynical way to think of the world, to think that basically you can't even escape the unjust application of power because the unjust application of power is this pervasive thing that, that is, it, it, it defines the entire way that we communicate, that we think what we claim is, is or isn't knowledge, um, that this was a, a kind of very you know, um, cynical project set up by people who happen to want to maintain their power. And then has this weird poisonous element to it, which is, oh, and it's maintained, by the way, through you you don't even know that you're maintaining the power system because it's been kind of inculcated into you and by the way that we speak, by what's considered true and false. And as you know, Foucault maintained, it wasn't, for example, whether something's true or false, it's all that interesting. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. What is, what's interesting is how power decided that somebody gets to say that it's true or false. The politics is the interesting part. So there's this profoundly cynical view of meaning-making, of understanding the world that we live in, that you know, the scientific method is again, is biology isn't a science that seeks to understand the world. It's merely a way for people who call themselves biologists to assert their power over people who want to have another opinion about what reality is, a biological reality is. And that this is just a regime of truth and that regime of truth will fall as political regimes always do and get replaced with another one that's of the same nature. This is a profoundly cynical way to look at the way that human societies are organized and the way that people participate in them. So um, as you acknowledge in uh, cynical theories, postmodernism is kind of this sprawling field. It is almost uh, intentionally resistant to a definition, but um, perhaps if you, you know, when people ask you to explain it, I get different answers from our, um, our different scholars. I like to think of it sort of as the attempt to continue on the, the grievance narrative, the good versus the bad people, um, the oppressors versus the victims um, in, in the wake or the shadow of the uh, practical and observable failure of Marxism economically. So I, I wonder if, if that sums it up or what else I might be missing. And then also just um, getting into this idea of postmodernism versus applied postmodernism. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, I think that does sum it up really well. I, the, what I would add to that uh, in particular is that um, postmodernism is a general skepticism of anybody's ability to claim to know anything, that knowledge itself is just a political contingency, which is a profound, again, cynical view on how the world works. And I think that this does spring from their you know, observation of the failure of Marxism uh, that, you know, they had their pet theory for how the world should work. So they already hated liberalism. They already hated religion. They already hated, you know, capitalism. They couldn't turn to those as Marxism fails. And what do they have left? Well, they were largely tied into the nihilistic French existentialist tradition. They're like, eh, everything's fake. Everything is a just another expression of power. Why? Because the thing that they had put their hope on, which was Marxism, was just another expression of power. And so rather than seeing the world through a lens that, you know, everything can become corrupted. So you have to remain vigilant not to allow corruption to take it over. Their view is everything is intrinsically corrupt. And the corruption is the story. It is, in fact, the defining characteristic of everything. And I think that it comes out of what you said. But if I were to, if somebody was to say to me, you know, one, you know, we got an elevator ride, one floor, what's postmodernism? 
It's the belief that knowledge and even the way that we speak about ideas is a political project that benefits certain people and not and, and excludes others, which is a really profoundly, you know, they, they call it a post-Marxist idea. It takes the Marxist conflict theory and applies it in a different domain, which is the idea of making sense of the world. So it's like almost a Marxist theory of understanding things. So nobody can truly understand things, but privileged people have set the terms of understanding on their own. And it really, it, it just becomes that. So in that sense, it becomes a project practically breaking rules. How do you break the rules? Where do you find anywhere the rules are? They must be arbitrary and represent power. So how do you break them? How do you smash the rules? Uh, because they benefit somebody and that somebody's probably not you. And if even if it is you, you're probably harming somebody who deserves better. So it's this kind of very, um, I don't know, destructive. I've, mm -hmm. I've compared it to a, an acid that can dissolve virtually anything. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of what I would, would summarize postmodernism as, as being, I think. Um, as wanting to destabilize. As, yeah, uh, it, it is a fundamental attempt to kind of like, if we can't have our party, then we're going to destabilize sort of everything. If we can't have what we want, well, nobody's going to have anything. But I'm not sure that they were that petulant. I mean, you look at the people that were guiding it. Jacques Derrida, I think, just got off in his... Like to give him a little credit, I think he was just a dorky academic lost in his ideas, which were all bad ideas. Michel Foucault had his own other motivations that don't have to be expressly stated necessarily, but people know what they are. Uh, he was, you know, tied up in various sexual proclivities. We'll, we'll leave it at that for the moment that he was trying to find ways to justify. And so, oh, no, there's this weird attempt to use the word madness to exclude people. We don't want to have power. We're crazy. We're dangerous. Oh, no, there's this whole history of sexuality where, you know, prevents people from, you know, being able to be perverts in various ways. Uh, and this is just a socially constructed disaster, you know, it, but you can tell you can say it's easy to see through, which is funny because Foucault was very Nietzschean in his approach. And Nietzsche was the one who's most famous for saying that the philosophers don't really do philosophy. They rationalize their own pathologies through lots of words. And it's like, yeah, that's you, uh, <laughs> Michelle. Um, we see you. So anyway, I mean, I think that your summary is actually pretty adequate, to be honest. Um, the goal yeah, is- and I, and I, But I, I thought that the addition of this perspective of cynicism also even helped me better understand some of the uh, more benign aspects of postmodernism, let's just say um, mm -hmm. aesthetically, mm -hmm. uh, some of the surrealism, there was, you know, almost a kind of playfulness, but there was still a cynicism. It was like we're abandoning the, the, pros the prospect of creating great art that's original and that has the prospect of ennobling or elevating or providing a window onto, you know, the transcendent uh, and we're just going to kind of doodle and squiggle and be be funny and just, you know, take something that is and reinvent it in, in a different way. Um, but you have this interesting perspective. And I it, what's been very fascinating to me watching you uh, on social media, watching your work over these past few years is it's almost like, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are just consumed with this postmodern perspective, um, they call themselves woke, but you almost have like a different kind of wokeness and being able to see where it's going next and how it's manifesting. Um, and, and also I thought was interesting, a lot of times um, libertarians and, and, and objectivists will say, oh, well, well, those are just the culture wars. Those are cultural issues. But uh, the framework that you present shows how actually th there is this uh, co co continuing project of trying to advance um, a, an egalitarian worldview uh, and it's applying it to, to various aspects of, of life, smashing the rules wherever they may be, uh, sexual or otherwise. Um, but I, so I wanted to ask, given our experience of, of the past two and a half years, um, I think one of the biggest shocks to Western civilization that we've experienced in my lifetime uh, has been uh, the, the way that um, government authorities uh, took advantage of um, the, the crisis, the real crisis of this pandemic 
to, uh, to try to, you know, remake society, reinvent uh, or reset capitalism. So um, just, just again, your perspective on, on what we've been through over the past, past couple of years. Yeah, and this kind of ties into the question that you asked before, the part that I didn't answer about the kind of evolution applied. of the applied postmodernism. Mm-hmm. So what we called applied postmodernism was essentially a bunch of radical activists who had various threads back into critical theories of different types. Some of them were post-colonial, some of them were uh, race theorists, some of them were um, post-structural feminists. They, they kind of picked up these tools, these postmodern tools, and started to apply them to their own activist projects. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, I have to just also, we are doubly thankful for, for Dr. Lindsay. He's getting over a cold and um, he's been traveling and he still showed up. So, still, yeah, hydrate. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I am. I got a little bit of a, a bug in Phoenix, so we're dealing with it. Uh, and I don't feel as bad as I sound, so don't worry about that too much. I just have the watery eyes from the coughing. Um, but no, these activists took this up and they uh, very diligently started to put it into practice in order to transform the institutions that they had gone into. And this follows the instructions of a Marxist neo-Marxist, Herbert Marcuse, from the middle of the 1960s going into the early 1970s. And he said that what you have to do is you have to infiltrate the institutions. It's not enough to be a Marxist that sits outside and criticizes. You actually have to go in and become the thing. So he said, if you, <coughs> excuse me, in counter-revolution revolt, which he did in 1972, he said, you know, if you're a computer programmer, you're going to be a person who brings your ideology into computer programming, but you're going to do the thing. If you're a biologist, you're going to bring your ideology into biology, but you're going to do the thing. And that's what we have to change. We have to take up what Rudy Deutschke called the long march to the institutions, largely through education, because everybody goes to college or to school to be whatever it is they're going to be. And so that, of course, is the project of Antonio Gramsci that was written about in the 1920s, and then he was in prison, so nobody saw it until much later, except the Soviets, because it was smuggled to Moscow. Uh, Maybe Mao, maybe. And so the whole project took on this, this new element, which was, let's turn the schools into places where this ideology can be deposited in the heads of people who are going to go out into the world and become the thing. And that's a very important piece to understand. The other thing that Marcuse did that's also very important to understand was he divorced Marxism from its traditional reliance on the working class. The working class, in his opinion, had become stabilized and thus betrayed the Marxist agenda. So now you need a new working class, is what he said uh, in, say, the SN Liberation from 69 you need to look to the racial minorities, to the feminists, to the outsiders, to the, to the uh, sexual minorities. You got to find these people and motivate them because they have the energy to be a revolutionary cadre, but they, they don't have the ideas. So you, what are you going to do? You're going to get those ideas to them by bringing them into the universities and by radicalizing the youth to go bring them into their areas. You know, so, you know, he teams up with Angela Davis, very radical black feminist. And all of a sudden, this German white guy is has like tons of street cred with a bunch of hip black radicals. Like, how do you think he would have been treated otherwise? Right. So he finds his way in to start giving the black Panthers, the black nationalists, the black liberationists of various stripes, the Marxist tools and neo-Marxist tools to understand their context and to re- redefine it. So all of a sudden, they're freed up from the shackles of having to pretend they care about the working class because the Marxists have never cared about workers in reality. Uh, They see them as a political opportunity and they moved this into domains where they can, can, can do it with identity politics instead. And since they're not shackled to the working class anymore, these bourgeois professors can become the people who direct it. And then eventually professionals can be the ones who direct it. And so this evolves over time. It's impossible to tell the whole story without bringing Paulo Ferreri's ideas about uh, knowledge and knowing into the equation, but I don't want to divert into that. It's a whole extra hour right there. But 
in essence, these things combined within the educational domain, particularly colleges of education, to create what we call woke now. And this is actually, I think if I had the chance to go back and do a second edition of Cynical Theories, if Helen was interested in doing it, the part where we, in chapter eight, where we talk about so-called social justice scholarship, I think I would want to call it just woke Marxism, mm -hmm. which is, or we call it also reified postmodernism which is where these postmodern tools, these critical theory tools had kind of been combined and they got mixed in with the Freirean idea that uh, knowledge itself, not in the way that the postmoderns did it, but through the educational certification process is also a, its own Marxist structure. People who are educated get to decide what it means to be educated and therefore they set it up as a country club for themselves to exclude other ways of knowing, blah, 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 yada, yada, Marxism, all over again in the domain of knowledge. And what you get now is this new woke Marxism where you are, if you read Freire, he's not ambiguous. Like he actually says that the process of becoming aware or conscientized, he calls it to oppression in his say pedagogy of the oppressed is a process of literal death and rebirth. He compares it to wow. so the like Easter. Mm -hmm. He, it is, it is born again. He actually, in, in his 85 book, the politics of education has like a three paragraph span in the 10th chapter where he openly says, not only does he say it is the Easter and that you have to go through it and re be reborn on the side of the oppressed. You must die to your, to your, uh, you know, bourgeois values and be reborn on the side of the oppressed. But he also says that the Easter that Christians celebrate is just a date on the calendar because they don't die and be reborn on the side of the oppressed, which is the only real Easter, which the only real Easter is to be reborn into Marxist praxis. He actually says that. And so it's like, this becomes this really different thing. And that's what I now conceptualize as woke. And that's this idea, you know, that, that, uh, every single domain can be pulled into a Marxist theory by saying that the knowledge system that operates within that domain, and you see how postmodernism feeds into that, is itself a construct of the people who want to maintain their dominance and power over others and keep other ways of knowing out. Now, Marxism is a, if, let's, let's give them the credit of being true religionists that actually believe what they say veridically as opposed to power hungry monsters. What Marxism operates as in every single instance, if we have the true believer who's just, we'll give them all the credit, they really do want the best, they think this is going to work, is it's the sales department for fascists. This is this great ideal world, utopian world that's going to come along. And then somebody who knows how to do things in the world, because Marxists don't, somebody who knows how to do things in the world is going to come along and graft onto that and create a totalitarian system out of it. And that's what seems to happen every time. I see that as having kind of arisen in the financial sector in the corporate sector, primarily 2008, 9, 10, 11, in the wake of the financial crash, when they realized that they could bust up Occupy Wall Street by sending in these identity politicians who make everything so complicated and poisonous and postmodern that nobody can do anything with it. And then he said, oh my gosh, we look progressive. Let's make our, our corporate emblem, you know, a rainbow flag this month. And we look great. And we're just here for the equity and for diversity. We behind all these great words. And meanwhile, we're crushing our competition. We understand go woke, go broke. And so smaller corporations will go broke faster than us. So let's force all these policies in place where that's the only way you can do business is to have this very expensive stuff. And they, they pulled a kind of corporatist, uh, well, frankly, they created a, uh, a conspiracy and a, 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 what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? A cartel that, mm -hmm you know, they set up the policies. Well, these are the correct environmental policies and these are the only way, these are the correct social policies and they're all rooted in all this identity politics, Marxist nonsense. These are the correct ways to run a company. These are the so-called ESG scores. And, you know, if you don't play ball, we're going to make it impossible to do business. We're going to restrict your access to investment capital. We're going to buy, you know, 20 to 30% of your stock using other people's money to do it. And then we'll threaten to sell it all if you don't participate with us. So we maybe we'll crash your company's value overnight. And so they have, you know, a, a gun to your a, a financial gun to their head. And all of a sudden we're not dealing in a place where corporate leaders can make, you know, decisions in the best interest of their, co their own corporation themselves, their clients, their customers. They're now making decisions according to, well, Larry Fink is going to kick me out of the club. If I don't do what Larry Fink said, it, what it kind of boils down to. And of course uh, we see that, you know, with the World Economic Forum having been pushing exactly these designs with lots of other weird designs, 
by the way, oddly tied to Paulo Ferreri all the way back to the 1970s um, through Ferreri's mentor, Dom Helder Kamara, who Klaus Schwab called his spiritual mentor, whom oh. Klaus Schwab risked his uh, entire organization to bring Dom Helder Kamara to, to Davos, to Switzerland in 1973 at their annual meeting, which was the third one they ever had. And he brought him in and he's like, it was illegal to bring him in. He had to get special permission from the, from the government of Switzerland to bring him in because he, uh, Dom Helder Kamara was not allowed to speak in Switzerland because he was a communist and Switzerland wasn't taking a side being neutral. And the, you know, the great debate, political debate of the middle of the last half of the 20th century. So what you see is this huge movement that's used all of these tools and kind of created this witch's brew of, oh, wow, this idea, like, for example, you talked about the COVID. Michel Foucault talked about biopower. This is a way that Michel Foucault warned that governments can control people. Let's do that. You know, and then, you know, jean Francois Leotard, if we're talking about the postmodernists, warned about the idea that you can create a false legitimation scheme, the legitimation by pyrology. Yeah, let's do that too. Let's just take over the media and make sure that that's how it works. John Baudrillard warned that we lived in a hyper real world of images where we can no longer access reality. We can't tell what reality is because we live in this constant world of images and we've lost the ability to discern it. So let's flood the zone with not just propaganda, but propaganda that comes from every single angle, propaganda that looks like education, propaganda that looks like uh, just the ads Entertainment. That appear or yeah. organically. The, your algorithm on social media feeds you certain tweets or certain Facebook posts or whatever. So it looks like that's just what people think. Relentless propaganda to create a hyper real experience of reality around you. And they've see, they see all the, I'm not giving Foucault and Derrida and Baudrillard and Leotard all this credit, <clears throat> but these lunatics saw these tools and picked them up and were like, this is how we win. And they were able to accomplish all of the Marxist agendas that the critical and cultural Marxists had laid out once they were able to use the postmodern and post-structural tools of divorcing people from being able to understand the world on its own terms, they, they removed all objectivity from the world and replaced it with literally pure uh, subjective first, or if we get fully Marxist, subjective leading the objective through a dialectical relationship between the two that puts primacy on the subjective rather than the objective. I don't know how technical you want to get, but this is what they were able to accomplish. And this is what they're doing to us at this point. Now, historically, Marxists did the same thing. This was Lenin getting frustrated that the stupid workers wouldn't do what they were supposed to do spontaneously, like Marx said. So he said, oh, we need a vanguard. The Bolshevik party is ready to go. And Stalin saying, basically, Marx was wrong, but man, it's me. Not, not I know what to do. It's me. You know, that, and, and then Mal picking this up and saying, oh, well, we need Marxist Leninism with Chinese characteristics to make, you know, to fit it into this context. It's it's me. You know, the same mentality, though, that you need this elite vanguard to usher the thing through and define the terms because the stupid people can't figure it out for themselves. That's your Klaus Schwab's. You know, they, they have this now universal acid in woke Marxism. And they're like, well, we'll put it in the S score of ESG. And now we're going to tell all the plebs what they're supposed to do. And we're going to, they've created the new Vanguard model. And it's funny that their one bank is actually called <laughs> Vanguard, <laughs> that they're ushering us through, you know, their intended change of history, their intended reset of history, their intended year zero or, uh, you know, whatever, whichever greatly forward, you know, which one do you want to uh, like attach it to? They're going to take us through this great revolution out of shareholder capitalism, where the goal is each company has got a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder returns and into a stakeholder capitalism, where a council of stakeholders is going to decide what the right policies are and which companies are better to prop up through crony investments and which are uh, best kind of like held down or knocked down. Like, you know, I don't know, an electric car company that's got like the cleanest record period. Like, let's just knock that out of the scores because he decided to buy Twitter um, and speaking of Tesla and Elon Musk, its owner bought did something we didn't like politically. So no, 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 no. Tesla's bad, bad score. But we have this crisis going on with energy. So Exxon Mobil, uh, environmental score plus plus. Let's bring it right up. Let's, in other words, let's have this council of stakeholders who gets to make the real decisions about how the world needs to operate at the biggest um, global political levels, and we'll tie all of the economic strings up through that. And of course, you know, it's good to pause. And say council of stakeholders, stakeholder capitalism. Yeah, well, what is the Russian word for council? Oh, yeah, it's Soviet. We have a Soviet establishing itself in terms of 
you know, literally global corporate governance. And that's largely because of the Western context is they have to get around our constitution. They have to find a way. And so as my friend Vivek Ramaswamy says, you know, they use the corporate back door to come in through the front door that the government's not allowed to go through. Joe Biden can't decree uh, that we're not going to, or that, you know, such and such is going to be censored on social media because it violates the first amendment, but Twitter can have its terms of service however it wants. So they have a back door, same mm -hmm. thing. Joe Biden can't say you can't buy or sell in the United States, but MasterCard can decide your liability and cut off your ability to have payment processing or PayPal can cut off your ability to have payment processing or any of these private corporations under the neoliberal guise of, well, they're corporations that can do whatever they want. Uh, it's their business. And this denial of service becomes actually a powerful weapon when you end up having a, what did Klaus call it, a public private partnership where the governments and the foundations and the uh, corporations start colluding. If you think of the government as one giant corporation and then say Disney is another giant corporation and that they start colluding, you know, in the kind of what we would used to call a trust organ a trust arrangement, then you can actually accomplish what neither of the two individually can, can do. If you have these shareholder or sorry, stakeholder agreements that they're all signed on to, say through the World Economic Forum where they've all made a commitment to support these agendas or else they risk the wrath of this financial sort of Damocles that's been hung over them, you can get thousands of corporations to march together, even if they don't want to, because they know it's not in their best, their best corporate interest to do otherwise, because you've got mm -hmm. a small number uh, council uh, of, of people who are, are able to pull all of those strings. It's really, it's, it's amazing that they've been able to pull this off. Uh, it's, you can also read the seeds of it throughout Marcuse. Yeah. It's, he wrote it all yeah. down in the 60s. They've just made it come true. Uh, and you bring that up to date with race Marxism. We're going to get to that, but we have been deluged by a bunch of questions across <clears throat> all of these social media platforms. So I sure. do not want to deny our great peeps an opportunity to ask you a question directly. So we've got one from Instagram, Aaron Malaire says uh, socialists like Vouch like to lecture people about praxis, but what does praxis actually mean? Okay. So praxis is theory informed practice, which is kind of complicated. How deep do you want this to go? Do you want to go back to Hegel and talk about the theoretical idea and the practical idea and the need to unify them into the absolute? I mean, so the idea is that um, Marxists believe that their theory is the, the first and last word on reality. They, Marx even said that the Wissenschaft Socialismus, the, the, the scientific socialism, is the first true scientific study of history and its conditions. It's the only scientific study of history, its conditions, and therefore sociology uh, and the unfolding of society. And so they call what they're studying in the world the real or the concrete or the actual or the objective conditions that people live in and the real or concrete or actual or objective causes that cause them. So their theory is what comes first. Practice is putting into application that which their theory says they should do. So they should maybe disrupt and dismantle. They should have a protest. They should have a riot. They should, you know, try to get onto a corporate board, or they should make sure that certain people uh, are able to get hired and other people fired, whatever. And then it only counts as praxis if it is informed by the theory so whatever you decide to do, your activity is not informed by, by your own thoughts. It's informed by your understanding of the theory. And then if secondly, afterwards, you reflect upon how what happened compared against what was going on in theory, what contradictions were revealed. So you remember Lenin saying it accelerate the contradictions. He wanted people to see the contradictions. And this made what he was doing praxis because they would see the contradictions in their environment. And when they saw the contradictions in their environment, he could then direct the disgruntled the satisfaction that arose from those onto a scapegoat or whatever, but this made it praxis. So, so praxis is activity that moves the objectives of Marxism forward. So mm -hmm. it is the attempted mixture of theory, of theory and practice, or you could say it's theory driven practice um, that constantly figures out how to inject more theory into whatever happened. So practic that, that's kind of very abstract. Practically speaking, what praxis looks like and means is that they're going to go do some, they're going to imp implement some idiotic policy, like equity policies at schools, and then sc scores are going to go down. And then they're going to come out and they're going to say that the reason that scores went down is actually because 
the school has a massive racism problem and it's not ready for a, uh, you know, anti-racist grading system that they imply er, installed or whatever, or an anti-racist education system. And so now you have to add in our anti-racist, a second anti-racist component or anti-racist training or anti-racist classes. In other words, the people aren't aware, the people pr- pr- uh, involved in that situation or system are not aware of the true nature of reality. So you have to bring them closer to the true nature of reality, and then they'll start to succeed is what it actually means. It is the praxis is when, you know, you take a, a, a prisoner in a Chinese thought reform prison and, under Mao, and you tell him you're accused of these crimes. And then your, your perspective, though, you're, you're very individualistic, you're capitalistic, you're imperialistic was a frequent word they used. Perspective on the world prevents you from being able to see that, you're, that you actually committed crimes against the Chinese people. Um, and so now we're going to interrogate you, and then we're going to send you back to your cell for struggle. And your, your cellmates are going to struggle you to help you see, to help you recognize, that's the actual term in Chinese, we're going to help you recognize your crimes from the people's standpoint. And so the idea of praxis is that you're going to basically start drilling theory into people's heads until they learn to see the world through theory. And when it's you, for you to do your own praxis, it's for you to take the Marxist theory, go put it into practice and figure out a way to make yourself more Marxist as a result and to do it again and again and again. So it's a kind of a self, uh, self-reinforcing self feedback loop of Marxist theory. If you go to the Marxist.org website and read their definition of truth, they actually kind of explain this. They say that the truth is a matter of a social formation for Marxists and it's always relative, but then they get down and they say, well, you know, this is what rationalist truth means, something about reason and, you know, whatever. This is what empiricist truth means, something about corresponding to the world. This is what uh, uh, pragmatist truth means. It means, you know, getting a result in the world. And it says that the Marxist view of truth is closest to the pragmatist view but that it must always follow from the combination of theory and practice. In other words, the true praxis. And so the true praxis is putting Marxist theory into action and then staring at what happened until you can figure out the Marxist reason for why it didn't work and this demand more Marxism as a result. That's the kind of bottom line of what praxis is. And the goal is, like I said, from Hegel to reunite the theoretical and the practical idea, at which point the absolute idea realizes itself as deity, and we enter into the perfect world order at the end of history. Okay, uh, I'm going to take this question from Gloriana12 on Instagram, because I I think it actually speaks, uh, it goes directly to one of the quotes that that I had excerpted um, from, from one of your books. She says, that she agrees that there seems to be a religion among progressives, but is it, but is it only one belief or, or multiple sects? And I think you've, you've spoken to that in terms of talking about CRT as just one denomination among a broader religion. Yeah, so yes, it's, it's multiple sects, uh, but there's kind of, what do you call it when you, um, in a religion when you have a bunch of sects that kind of come together under a single like ecclesiastical ecclesiastical um i can't think of the word there's a word for this um when when you know they all kind of come together uh and and talk about how they're sort of manifestations of the same thing and that's intersectionality for these people intersectionality is the idea that all of the forms of oppression are reflected in all the other forms of oppression but that they're all still distinct so there's kind of one overarching sect but you know, the critical race theorists are they're the people who focus primarily on it are going to get most aggrieved about race and they're going to sometimes attack the other groups. The queer theorists are going to get most aggrieved about sex, gender, and sexuality, but they're sometimes going to attack the other groups and so on. So I would definitely say, especially when you get outside of the identity politics thing, though, that it starts being definitely multiple religions um, that are coming together kind of in this way, like the, the COVID thing. Mm-hmm. is another example of the exact same religious mindset and you know people go back and forth should we call this woke or should we not call it woke but we should call it woke because it's still deriving from the idea that uh you know we have to look at certain ways of knowing and other ways of knowing it's, it's just complicated because it's a vanguard model so it's it seems to be self-contradictory so bear with me a second the marxist theory of knowledge is in medical knowledge is well, we've, you know, certain people have established themselves as medical authorities and they've excluded other people from their ways of knowing, et cetera. And they do this to maintain their own power. And you're already thinking, oh my God, that's what they're doing. 
but that's always what the Vanguard does because there's the one with the correct theory. So you see this problem is is a stupid plebs can't be trusted to do this. And this is where the Vanguard of Lenin or Stalin or Mao comes in. You have to have an elite that comes in and understands the right answer to these questions and moves things along. And so the COVID thing follows this whole thing exactly the same. It's just that the Vanguard's much more obvious. It's more of a top-down process than a bottom-up identity politics thing. Uh, same thing if we move into the realm of environmental uh, justice or climate justice or climate change. Uh, again, you have the exact same thing. There's a council of experts and nobody else is allowed to have an opinion about it at all. Nobody else is allowed to ask questions, et cetera. You've got a Soviet that's just determining what the right answers to those are. But those are, in a sense, the climate change, like kind of Malthusian death cult that's clearly working hand in glove with the weird COVID, whatever in the world, maybe also Malthusian, let's hope not, but ish, uh, death cult. And then the identity politics death cult are all somehow working hand in glove together, but they're actually, in a sense, kind of different denominations. You could have people who are very invested in the environmental or the uh, medical one and not necessarily into the identity politics one, but they're, it's really kind of a one, it's like, it's like uh, they're all in a sense Baptists, but some Baptists believe you have to baptize at birth. Some people think you can't do it till they're like seven. Some people it can only be a confessing adult. You know, all these different rules on when you can baptize each other and they all hate each other um, and have like intense disagreements and they can, some can drink and some can't drink and all of this other complicated crap, but they're all Baptists. In a sense, this is all one kind of woke knowledge is uh, knowledge is understood in a Marxist and or Leninist way and in different domains, it, it comes up in different ways. Um, so yes, it, different denominations different sects, but they're all in one kind of a, and I cannot, I still can't believe I can't think of the religious word for this because I got ecclesial like in my head and that's not it. I mean, we can go with that. That's not it. Yeah. But we'll figure it'll <laughs> pop in my head at an awkward moment later. Um, all right. Well, I yeah. wanted to uh, just Nina uh, Morose, who is a supporter of the Atlas Society. Uh, just uh, she is weighing in. She's very excited to hear this discussion but she was also helpful in recommending not just Dr. Lindsay's books, but his new Discourses podcast for anyone who wants to understand this philosophy, its origins and its current tactics. Uh, she's giving you a testimonial. She's learned a great deal from, from them. So um, go ahead to a commercial and tell us a little bit about, uh, about the, the podcast. Okay. The word is ecumenical, by the way. Uh, I told you it'd come into my head. It's an ecumenical council of various sects of religions. And somebody, Scott Schiff, it says, has commented, depression theory is the underlying theology that's correct because it's Gnosticism. It's all Gnosticism. They're all sects of Gnosticism. So Gnostics are people who believe that they've been flung into the world against their wishes and they suffer in the world. But there's an absolute truth that if you access it, you can break free of the prison of the world. And for Marxists, because it's collectivist, it only works if everybody breaks free together all at the same time. So it's different people who suffer in different ways. Maybe they suffer with, oh my God, I could get a disease I don't want. Oh my God, climate change might ruin the whole planet. Oh my God, you know, racism posed upon us. Oh my God, I'm a boy that feels like I belong in a girl's body or something like that. And it's all the exact same. It's all variations on the same thing. Oh my God, I'm a rich asshole named Karl Marx who wishes everybody to pay my bills for me. So I'm going to write a bunch of fake economic theory. <clears throat> okay, so what's going on at New Discourses? Well, you kind of just heard. Um, this is like kind of the nature of what I do. Uh, I actually, I spend all my time reading Marxist literature and then comparing against other Marxist literature and trying to figure out what in the heck it says and where it fits, like how does it work? And in particular, as you kind of just picked up, I'm very interested in tracing it back as a religious movement that I think is actually a combination of a number of mystery religions that were kind of popular in Europe in the you know late 18th century, mid 18th century, going into the 19th century that cobbled themselves into a uh, kind of scientist, scientistic, not scientific framework. The science was arising. Nobody knew what science was in, say, 1807. Uh, if you know why that date's important, good for you. Nobody quite knew what science was, was then. People were making stabs at it. And maybe, I don't know, GWF Hegel made a stab at it in maybe 1807 and called something a system of science and trying to explain what science is and how it works. And they kind of cobbled Gnosticism into a scientific or scientistic, I should say, scientism being their kind of new framework uh, way of thinking about things. And so what I do with new discourses is I, I mean, the name should tell you, I try to give 
new ways to talk about these issues. I feel like the academic establishment has failed us. How they couldn't see this tyranny coming uh, is something of a mystery, but it's largely because it was their tyranny that was coming. Uh, and so they were perhaps motivated not to see it or just busy doing their own academic things. But certainly I don't accept the mainstream interpretations of critical race theory or queer theory or postmodernism or even uh, Marxism itself. I try to break that down. Right now I'm in a huge stretch of doing critical education theory and or critical pedagogy as it's also called. And I'm actually breaking down um, Paulo Ferreri, which has forced me to go back and read a lot of Hegel and a lot of Marx and to really and a lot of George Lukács, the Hungarian Marxist, to try to understand how this actually operates kind of as a system of faith or theology. And so I do these long form podcasts where I read through primarily, sometimes I just talk, but mostly what I do is read through their documents and explain what it says. Like, this is what they're saying. This is where this comes from. This is a little reference you might not have caught. It's, it's almost like a college class where I go through academic papers, books, chapters, et cetera, and try to bring you into the ability to see and read Marxist literature, whether it's the woke kind of today, whether it's the sustainable kind of Klaus Schwab, whether it's the old school, like Karl Marx's 1844 manuscripts. I want you to be able to see what's there as I see it. If I'm right, cool. If I'm wrong, well, at least it's out there and people can criticize it. So that's also cool. Uh, so that's what I try to do. The books are just kind of extensions of that. I just try to explain like race Marxism tries to explain how the, the, if we think of Marxism as like an engine of a car and it was in the economic car, somebody lifted the engine out mm-hmm. did a few tweaks and stuck it in a new car that's race. And then they did the same thing to make queer theory. I don't have a book for that, but they stuck it in the, in the, well, I say, we'll say a queer body to make it go, uh, in another direction where, you mm-hmm. know, the, you, the, the bourgeois property is being normal or being considered normal and so on and so forth. So I try to make these things as clear as possible. That is, it's largely all I do actually. I, I, <clears throat> I'm going to spend the rest of my night reading another piece of Paulo Ferreri's education theory that, uh, I've read like 11 times already because I'm trying to finally organize the podcast that will get me out of this book and into something different. So, all right. Um, well, we have eight more minutes. There is a question here that I'd love to get to, but if there are any others that you see in the thread that uh, really speak out to you, then, uh, then go ahead. But uh, again, on Instagram, Brenning999 asks, what do you think is a bigger threat to America today? Woke Marxism or the alt right that the woke Marxist and even some libertarian types seem to be terrified of. And I thought that was interesting because I, I do think that in cynical theories, you, you talk at, at the end about liberalism and the fact that the kind of um, post, the applied postmodernism is, is energizing yes. um, the, the nationalist right, which could present you know, in itself a threat, but uh, with the time that's gone by um, since you've written the book and, uh, you know, now we're also seeing some, some policies, uh, which, you know, some might describe, I would, as uh, a liberal coming out of uh, the Supreme uh, Court. Um, So, yeah, what's, what's the bigger, the bigger threat? Okay, so this actually turns out to be a complicated and timely question. Um, The immediate threat, <clears throat> far larger threat is woke Marxism. I mean, if we end up in what's, well, that, that's not precisely true. Woke Marxism is a tool for this huge corporatist, fascist, communist, weird Klaus Schwab, new world order thing. And if we mm-hmm. end up in that, we're all screwed. There'll be no freedom for anybody anywhere ever again. Uh, like never, we'll never get out of the digital prison that they're going to build uh, in all likelihood. And so Think of what China is doing as stage one out of like five progressive stages of worse tyranny, like with all the surveillance, all of the, you know, being able to turn off your money whenever they want, et cetera. And that's like step one of five. The last steps are like literally getting inside of your head with like implantable devices to control your thoughts. No kidding. That's the program of the World Economic Forum tyranny that woke is enabling. So that's by far the biggest threat to freedom in the world. Now, if we step back from that, woke is probably the larger of the dangers 
in terms of its ability to create dysfunction. The alt right is an is is an imprecise term. What mm-hmm. it tends, to, what it seems to refer to, doesn't exist in any significant capacity. But what it covers up by using this incorrect term is something that's called the post liberal right. And I'm actually very afraid of the post liberal right, which is rapidly gaining context and and uh, support. And I don't mean like on the internet with 25 year olds, which is kind of its primary base of support. I mean, with influential people with lots of money and people who are in government and running for positions in the government who believe that the liberal order has failed, has come to its end and has to be replaced with something else. Uh, That is, you know, basically the idea is, well, we couldn't keep society free. So if we're going to live in an unfree society, better hours than theirs. And so they want to go ahead and, you know, grab the club and start whacking people with it. And this has very ascendant energy because the procedural liberal order where the law rules, not any individual, seems not to be able to contain the woke problem. So people are becoming increasingly desperate, realizing that we're increasingly close to the possible success of this tyrannical great reset. They're becoming increasingly warm to the idea of fascist isn't the right word, but reactionary is reactionary Mm -hmm. solutions to the problem that will not favor individual freedom and liberty either. And that will at some point, because woke is rapidly now on the decline, not necessarily institutionally, but its popularity is through the floor. That's on the decline. Whereas this post-liberal right is on the ascent at some point in the near future, which I would guess would probably be within the next six to 10 months probably just six before the end of the year, we will see a switching of which of the two is presents the largest uh, immediate danger Um, because it depends if they've got another big trick up their sleeve at the world economic forum or whatever, then that may not be the case. But right now woke is the, is the access point to that. Now, the thing is, is the post-liberal right are producing the conditions that the weirdo globalists can take advantage of in exactly the same way. So it's going to blow up in their faces too. Um, They want to do crazy things like split apart the United States, which um, is a vehicle that's part of the program is to get rid of countries like the United States because they're big and unified and control lots of assets and resources and so on. So this post-liberal right actually freaks me out. And I'm sort of looking down the road. I'm like, okay, are we have, we have, we have like a, I don't know. We have like a giant attacking us right here. And then a hundred miles down the road, there's going to be like a dragon and it's like crap, you know? So that's a complicated answer, but the thing that gets called the alt right isn't real. Um, Not really. I mean, there are people that do that. Like for example, everybody trots out Charlottesville, but they don't know that for example, the people with the tiki torches were paid by the same people that paid the people on the other side of that whole fake conflict they were all paid by the same weird globalist interest to create a conflict that they could use to do a reflexive media push that was a question by the way here in the q a is could i explain reflexivity yeah it's creating a story and flooding it from every direction so that you think it becomes it becomes true by people thinking it's true so an example of a uh, classic reflexive statement is this is a revolutionary moment it's false until enough people believe it to make it real and then or the economy is going to collapse Well, that's false unless a lot of people believe it and go rip all their money out of the market and it collapses all at once. And so reflexivity is a means of projecting into the world that which you want to create in the world and then creating a uh, media environment where everything somebody encounters or a cognitive environment where everything they encounter reinforces it. So they just believe it's inevitable and happening. So they go along with it. Self-fulfilling prophecy on purpose in a sense. And that is what... um, that's the the kind of environment that I see happening around this post liberal right rising up is oh well we have no other option than to go fully uh, forceful. Um, somebody says who are the intellectual leaders of the post liberal right? Well, Alexander Dugin in Russia, uh, Putin's guy. You might look into him. He's probably the most intellectual of them. Curtis Yarvin, uh, who used to write under the code name Mencius Moldbug is a neo-reaction, is his philosophy or dark enlightenment. He's a post-liberal guy. Uh, Politically, J.D. Vance is running for office as a post-liberal. I've heard, but I don't know that Blake Masters is post-liberal. You kind of run into these guys um, possibly. I don't think, I don't, I mean, I don't know if they, if they doubt that the constitutional order can, can continue, 
in the United States and they're probably post-liberal. Uh, and I, I really worry about it, about that, but the kind of big philosopher types are going to be kind of fringe characters like Curtis Yarvin and then whatever in the world Alexander Dugan represents behind Putin and whatever that's all about. Fascinating. Well, and I see uh, Vance and Masters are teal guys and I prefer them over Romney types. Yeah, nobody should prefer Romney types. That's a disaster. Romney's a disaster. We, we agree on that uh, kind of a choice between lessers of, of two, two evils, but uh, yes. All right. Well, um, that is taking us to uh, the end of the interview. This has been absolutely spectacular. Thank you very much. I'm going to release you to go and spend the rest of your uh, evening, as you said, uh, reading um, neo-Marxist education philosophy. Wouldn't it be fun? Uh, and, and what can we do? Um, I guess I just would close with what can we do to support your work or, or what would you say the priorities uh, for the people that, um, that are concerned about this threat and, and uh, what would you recommend that they do to help um, protect the freedoms that we, we all cherish? Sure. I mean, the first and most important thing to do if you want to protect freedoms and things, it has nothing to do with me, is to um, take the issue seriously and to start learning about it. Uh, I believe in, the, I read a Polish proverb a number of years ago that I firmly believe, which is do not attempt to cure that which you don't understand. Imagine what kind of things you might inject into your body if you tried to cure something you didn't understand. Imagine what could happen. Never attempt to cure something you don't understand. And so start studying this. You need to, you know, read race Marxism if you want. And if you think it's wrong, great. Write thoughtful criticism of it. If you think it's right, or you think parts of it are right, advance the thought. I mean, this is something that needs to be happening. Um, I think that if you want to support what I'm doing, the most valuable thing to do is actually to share the materials. If you go check out the New Discourses podcast or the New Discourses website and you find something on there useful, share it with somebody. Um, I'm not like about to ask anybody for money. I don't care. Uh, I want the materials to get out there. It's like I said, with Cynical Theories, it did, did very well. And I'm just happy that it got into as many hands as it did. And that means the most valuable thing you can do is to help other people realize this is a moment where sitting on the bench is not going to be acceptable. Freedom really is you know, for real at serious risk, we can disagree about little details here or there, about a lot of things, but freedom is something that we must all stand up to preserve. And the way that you're going to do that is by understanding the problem and then being willing to take action in accordance with your best understanding of the problem. And so getting materials out that are talking about the issue, because certainly, you know, they're not going to put me on CNN to make sure lots of people hear what I have to say. Mm -hmm. sharing those ideas, if you thought what I have to say is interesting or valuable is kind of up to you and you kind of have to make it grassroots and, and, and flowing outward uh, from, from your little, your, whatever, maybe your reach is big, maybe your reach is small, but whatever it is, it's kind of within that range. But the most important thing is you have to do something. And it starts, I hate, I've been telling people for like three or four years, they're like, you know, what do you, what do you have to do? And I'm like, you're going to hate me for what I'm about to tell you. You have to actually learn some of this before I know you don't want to, you actually have to learn some of this before you can possibly take it on. It's not hard once you break through the surface, but the surface is complex and it's confusing and it seems like it's nonsense. And then you finally break through. And like somebody said in the comments, it's just the theory of oppression. Correct. That's right. That's all it is. Right. Well, and so everyone who's been watching, you can start right now by sharing this interview on your social media. And uh, of course, tag um, Dr. Lindsay. He is at Conceptual James on Twitter and I believe on Instagram as well. I think uh, on all we'll, of them. Oh, okay, great. And while he's not going to uh, ask, make a pitch for money, I, I would say uh, for those of you who are enjoying this kind of content and want us to do more of it, um, perhaps even do a pocket guide on critical race theory, uh, please consider supporting the Atlas Society with a tax deductible donation. Tune in next week. I'm going to be um, interviewing Chris Wright of Brightbeam. And then the following week, I'm going to be interviewing Jack Carr. I've been talking to my, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite nonfiction authors today. And we're going to turn to one of my favorite living uh, fiction authors with Jack Carr in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay, for this interview and for all of the work that you do.
Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay.